Okay. Uh, these three exceptional artists have shattered uh, geographical uh, boundaries and brought forth a plethora of creativity, imagination, and passion uh, through their ex exquisite works. They have honed their skills to perfection, and we are privileged to witness the beauty of their artistry today. Um, let us all revel in the brilliance of their achievements and appreciate the power of their art to transcend cultures, um, skills, uh, beliefs, and perspectives. So we have a list of speakers today. We we'll first um, welcome um, Chris, um, uh, Professor Professor Roland Shu. Uh, he is the uh, he is um, a son of Professor Xu Xu Kai Yu Xu Jie Yu Jiao Shou. Um, the contribution of the contributions of the three masters across the Pacific Ocean have undoubtedly enriched the North American art circle, and we owe it to Professor Xu Kai Yu for bridging this cultural gap and introducing us to the marvelous works of art. And let's welcome Professor Roland Shi. So I'll share the screen of his presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, professor Roland Shi is a professor of uh, Stanford in-, in Research fellow is Yeah, research fellow. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'll- let me share the screen. Okay. I'll share screen here. Huh? Huh? It's not responding. Okay. There. Here. It's just slow, but it's working. Share. Uh, it takes time for it to respond. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Let me enlarge it a bit. I'll make it a slideshow. Okay. So let's let me. Okay. So Professor, would you sit here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So, Oh, okay. okay. Oh, so they can see me too. Yeah, so the online people can see. You. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I will be speaking to you and to the yeah. to the uh, Zoom audience. Zoom sphere. <laughs> can you all hear me? <laughs> so I try to be visible. Oh, okay. Now we can. Yeah. yeah. So I try to be visible on the stream, but also, sorry if you have to crane your neck a little bit. It's much more interesting to look at what's there than look at me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you today, truly an honor. And I thank to Jianghua for inviting us all and for this magnificent show of these three artists. If any of you, if you had the chance to see in the very beginning, the text, the introduction to the show, Jianhua and his team have told the basic story that artists, in addition to the importance of their art, also are part of a community. And sometimes those communities need catalysts or those who have vision to try to bring them together. So the story that I'm telling today about Xu Jieyu, a professor who was my father, is the story relevant to this particular exhibit. That is, how did these three artists have three-part shows in the San Francisco Bay Area? Why those three? How, when, and where? And also, I can note that uh, my fellow speakers who will be following me from the Via Montalvo, we were all noting that we would very much appreciate if any of you in the audience have additional historical stories that you can help us with, because I'll be mentioning where there are gaps in mine. So we very much invite either during my talk or afterwards, you say, oh, I'm, I can fill in something that you got to, and then there was a gap. We, we look for that, we invite that. 
So my story today is about these three painters from the point of view of being remote from where we are. They were doing beautiful art. They were at Art Academy in China and then traveling for many different circumstances. But the Pacific Ocean was a barrier, especially if you put your mind back to 1960. The Pacific Rim is an extremely wide geographic range, but also culturally a gulf or a divide between East and West. So the story that I'm telling today through the eyes of my father is the story of how the Western eyes, if we imagine from the San Francisco Bay Area, looking westward across the ocean, how Western viewers began to see and appreciate these three artists. It's by no means obvious or inevitable that they would have gained an audience here. Chinese art, or that is traditional watercolor painting and calligraphy was of course a revered and time-honored tradition in the East. There were some in the West who knew of it, but certainly did not necessarily know the contemporary variants. The new artists were coming who had trained, but who were making their own style. And if you think back to the 1960, you can imagine perhaps some reasons why they would not know, why we sitting here in what is now called Silicon Valley would not know of these artists. If you remember the politics of the time, right? 1960, all of you, I don't have to tell you what was going on in China. And one of the important or most consequential outcomes of what was happening in China under Mao was a kind of a wall between East and West. And in fact, the way uh, this country reacted to anything we knew of China was to put up a wall as the enemy. But for the story that we don't have to get into here, around the mid 1960s, there began to be more interest in the West in what was happening in China, in part because as you know, this triangle of geopolitics between the US, China, and the Soviet Union. Some people in the West, such as Xu Jiayu, my father, saw a potential opening to motivate people in the West, in the United States, to be interested in China. In particular, in the intellectual and artistic world of China. My father, so I'm gonna just tell very briefly a uh, little biography as relevant for this exhibit. I'm not gonna indulge in the family stories, but in the career. So Tai Yushu, as he was known here, his most relevant biographical story is that he was from Sichuan through the, si the period of the Sino-Japanese War, was part of the movement of moving the entire university to a different part of China, and then became conscripted into the army, the Nationalist Army at the time. But he was conscripted because he was fluent in English. He was a scholar of literature. That was a whole generation that came to the United States, a very different story. But when he came to the United States, he came with a vision in the mid 1940s of bridging East and West. Through many different routes, he became a professor at San Francisco State College at the time, now San Francisco State University. He founded the Chinese program that is now continuing to thrive and grow. And the Chinese program is within the Department of Foreign Languages. He, as you can see his, his dates here, 1982, uh, his life was cut short by, and I only mention this because it's relevant to us, I mentioned the gaps in our story. Uh, he died when our family home was hit and devastated by a landslide in the winter of 1982, right in January. The consequence for our curiosity is that we lost many of his papers. 
but we were able to salvage a number of papers. I will be discussing what I can find thus far. We have our friends from the Carbo who also have information. You all do too, I can imagine, from the families of these painters. Uh, there's some of his calligraphy on the right. I only show some of him in action doing painting because he was an avid student of the artists we are focusing on today. He was trying to learn from the masters. Going through those papers, I was talking to Jian Hua. Okay, you want me to do a talk? What do I have? I thought, I have nothing. And then I, I was looking and I was very touched that you want me to talk about my father. What would I talk about? I talk about Chinese art and such. What did my father say? And I came across one document that my brother, there are two sons, my brother and I digitized from the remaining papers. And I was starting to read it, and, I'm, and I don't mean for you to have to study this on the screen. I'll tell you what the most important part of this is. So this is, it's faint because of the technology of the time. It's a mimeograph, right? That's how we would produce, um, um, reproduce documents. So this is in our family collection, and I have put together, it's a full page. I just took the very beginning, the very begin, the very end. This is marked in his own handwriting on the back, press release for KCBS radio. So he was very active as a professor, scholar of literature to try to engage the community, people outside of the college. And he was writing press releases for, at that time, really where everybody's getting their news was AM radio. So KCBS radio, this is a press release. Contemporary Chinese paintings, which exhibit masterful linear control are on display at the gallery lounge of San Francisco State College, the authors of these works, and there we are are three, and he calls them professors, because as you see, the language that he was using are in the Bay Area during the exhibit are available for interview media. Be ready to talk with them, to hear their voices as well as see their paintings through the sponsors of the college and the foreign language department. So you have from the point of view of an uh, active scholar like Xu uh, Jiayu, like my father, thinking how to endorse their paintings. They should be able to speak on their own, but in a, for an audience that has no exposure, no, no um, pre-developed pre interest, they're going to have to see institutional support. So he's underlining that a department at a, a higher education, at that time college in the city, and that this, and at the very end, there was uh, information about the student union popularized this. So, and he, and the, what's missing from this in the middle is a whole, three paragraphs, one on each, sort of like Jan Hua's uh, biography here, but what my father underlined was their uh, academic affiliation, where they had trained, where they were teaching, and so on. So he's underlining, this is a university to university, scholar to scholar, artist to artist bridge. From the point of view of somebody really thinking through, if you can't put your mind to, how would you try to solve the problem of no audience for, but a very rich artist coming, a, 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 a artist who makes very rich material? How would you try to prime interest and validate coming to the show? He's building an entire support connection, politically, intellectually, and artistically. And you see down the very beginning, very big bottom, that's his signature. Um, so this is from uh, December, 1964, the show. This is the show. Oh, oh. <laughs> and if any of you are interested in some of these documents I show you, uh, I don't have them today. They're in a very safe place in our home. Um, I'd be happy to show you um, or to, to, to uh, look at them together because I am thinking um, we should write some more uh, about this, write this story. So this is really the piece that I that I wanted to to um, open with because this shows the first exhibit and you can still find that gallery on the San Francisco State University campus when the three of them are named as should be seen together. <clears throat> Quickly to, to to just frame the two points that I'm going to talk about very brief here just take about twenty more minutes. Um, opening Western eyes to China. 
that from the point of view of someone like my father, who's trying to solve the problem of developing an audience for these artists, he's thinking, he was thinking in terms of developing an entire understanding and curiosity about their home culture. So opening our eyes to China, and then finally I'll show you from our family papers, many other exhibits that he was writing, documenting, promoting that included these artists. So how do you, here's our question together, how do you develop from really truly a naive point of view of, uh, in this country, how do you educate in just a few years uh, a, a, a community here of the richness of China, richness of the whole story beyond a stereotype or a frightening specter of Maoist politics, let's say. And so very briefly, I noted, my father published many, many books. This is just a, a very short number of his books, but they are for helping us understand this question of him thinking through. You have here a picture really of how an, art, how an author thinks through a sequence of publications from 1960s, early 1960s. That first title is his title for a five volume language instruction book of Mandarin Chinese. And he was able to um, uh, win a, Carne a large foundation grant from Carnegie Foundation to promote language instruction, Mandarin Chinese language instruction throughout the state of California in primary and secondary schools. And Dragon to Man thread the story of a cultural narrative from China of the origin of the people from the lair of the dragon. So that you learn language, you learn culture. 1968, the very first openings, if any of you can remember or have read some of the story, we now know looking backwards where the secret communication between uh, Nixon Kissinger and Mao and Zhou and what became the ping pong diplomacy and finally the visit in 72. My father sent his book, John, this is the first significant English language intellectual biography of Zhou Enlai. Note that he didn't write on Mao, he wrote on Zhou, right? To have an intellectual figure who had trained in the West, had gone to Paris, had um, interacted with artists in Paris. My father was writing this whole story, pick up his biography. He was already looking at how Chinese leaders had been learning about Western artists. And now it was our turn for American audience, uh, leaders to learn about Chinese authors. So he sent this to Nixon in 1970. And I still have that little letter where he perhaps naively said, dear president, I think you should read my book before you go. <laughs> and we got the very nice letter back, which we have as well. Thank you very much. We'll be putting this in the White House library. So I'm sure he never cracked open the book, but the next, I uh, just, and with these last three uh, texts, you see Sri Jiu's intellectual journey from teach language, engage politics, to delve closely into the arts. Chinese literary scene, 1975, this was the first opening for contemporary writers in China to be read in the West. All of them are translated in English. It's a very large volume, it's an anthology, all translated by my father. And those translations are still used today. Many times we get royalty requests, um, a copyright request. Qi Bai Shi, the first, and uh, along with, co-authored with, uh, with uh, Fang Yuan. A monograph, I'll oh, thank you very much, yeah. monograph for the first time in English, looking at this artist, so the bridge between traditional and contemporary styles. And then finally, probably his, his biggest seller, Literature of the PRC. So this is the story that he finished from the 1975 publication. When we all went, actually there was, a, again, the story we want to get into today, in 1973, 74, we went to China. You can imagine what, what life was like, what we saw. We had a family reunion. My father was the, one of the first Western uh, scholars to be able to go around on his own, interview um, authors and artists, poets and painters, let them have their own voice. 
It turns out this made the um, Mao government very nervous, but nevertheless, in the West, my father was able to publish. Okay, so that's the story of the author, Chu Jiayu, trying to develop the readership, the larger, he wrote, these were all published, not academic, this is Double Day, Random House, which are now sort of like Simon Schuster, you know, just get it out there. Uh, the Zhou Enlai book got him on the Today Show, like a morning show, when the word broke that Nixon was heading to China. So what is this China? So, but now zeroing in on the art, uh, 21, again, you don't have to follow all of these, right? Because I got three slides of these. Well, I have all of these uh, exhibit catalogs, artist monographs, pamphlets from shows like these. I pulled out a list of 21 of these, highlighted the ones in yellow that have local gallery venues. All of these are contemporary Chinese artists, either from China or in diaspora, uh, Southeast Asia, that include, these catalogs all include, a, from my father, a, um, a short artist biography or a um, comment on how to view his paintings. Uh, and including in several of them, uh, extended comments on traditional Chinese painting, as well as what to look at in the contemporary artist's inflection or modification of the tradition. And you'll, you'll recognize some of these galleries, any of you who are old timers from San Francisco, the East Wind Gallery uh, and the like. Uh, and then, and so there's in UC Santa Cruz, uh, Carmel, the Lackey Gallery that uh, Tianhua mentions in the uh, introduction to this, an exhibit that he co-organized with curators at University of Kansas and then brought to San Francisco State in 72. So we're now eight years after that first show in 1964. Again, if anybody is interested in any of these catalogs, uh, we have them at home. Here's an example of one that I could pull up. I wish that I had the equivalent for our other two magnificent artists, but I do have this one from, from James Liu. I remember him and family very closely. We lived, we were neighbors in Tiburon uh, visiting his house on Art Row from the main street. Uh, and I remember my father going to his house to his, and to his little studio on main street to learn from Master Liu. And here, so again, this slide is a, is a compression. I, put, I pulled three parts of the brochure, tried to get it on one slide. The top part uh, that my father put together, just you see how short the artist biography is. I, I pulled from the, the footer of this pamphlet, the gallery. Uh, so there's that Ghirardelli Square, uh, at this significant gallery for the time that my dad was um, uh, connecting with to promote artist after artist coming from across the Pacific. And then the very last part, this is part one of part two, the next slide. He's got a little essay on Chinese painting. You only write this assuming that the people coming to the show need it. They have no idea where this comes from, what tradition. And you see his language is, 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 a, is some would call basic, scholars would call it essential. What you need to know to frame the most primitive, from the most primitive to the most sophisticated, and the most sophisticated can seem to be the most primitive, the artist universally has been trying to retell on canvas an experience he has come to know. You hear the language of universalizing or bridging Chinese. This is not alien. This is what we all seek to try to represent what we see inside the mind. And the next slide shows, if you flipped over this brochure, he says, okay, Let's look at who we are today, what we're looking at today. Contemporary Chinese painting, and that is actually his full paragraph. So in just a few sentences, he says, shift your mind from the universal, the timeless of Chinese art tradition, the repetitive stroke pattern to learn from the master to how these artists, including when they come to the West, are learning to incorporate individuality into their well-trained tradition. And I just underline the sentence. Uh, um, I went too, too far, I gave away. <laughs> um, I underline 
he had been talking about the tradition of Chinese painting rendering nature. But put your mind to when this was, roughly late 60s. And I don't have a date on this, but I, I estimate it's 68. His garden of serenity laid in ruin by the conflicting forces in the world of man. The Chinese artist has to rebuild an order out of chaos. Here is a, an art historian scholar, my father, trying to help us understand that the world you may often see in traditional Chinese painting is well ordered, is poetic, is peaceful, but our contemporary Chinese artists have seen the laid waste of war. They have seen ruin and yet they are still painting the beauty of nature. So understand how much is at work in the contemporary Chinese artist's mind as they render another landscape or another lotus. This is a greater leap than their forefathers. Last, a few paint photos, Zhang Daichan at our house, just a few photos of the art that was on our family walls as my father would invite artist after artist. I was only a, a small boy, but even I could recognize that, you know, he would kind of get ready, like let's have painting ready on the table after dinner that he was bringing somebody that he really wanted to encourage to show him how they were doing their art, including their materials when they would bring acrylic, when they would bring mixed media. So Zhang Ge Chen, there, that's actually when he was painting on our dining table, which we still have. And he's painting in that, so, so Jiang Hua would know this technique, the, the two sheets, right? Two rice paper sheets, and he's painting with a heavy brush. So that's loaded with, with water. And he's painting, and you can see he's, he's developing his style of the uh, lotus, uh, the big lotus leaf, that dark form. And afterwards, when he considered it finished, would lift and see what's on the second sheet. What has come through, right? You know that, that Zhang Gechen known for this technique. Underneath, he was displeased with it, the family story. Even I remember this from after my father died, my mother told me the story, he said, ugly. It's ugly. I'm going to throw this out. <laughs> My father panicked. <laughs> Never throw this out. Just can we have another glass of wine? Okay, glass of wine. And then he said, look at it again, please, master, through the lens of the wine. And he said, so you see that basic dark form. And he's, and so not all of that comes through, much of it does. And he said, all right, for you, this is a landscape. And he finished it as a mountain cliff. And he dedicated to my father. And he says, this is an example that blood is thicker than wine because we are brothers. Okay, very, very kind of him. And my mother had that in her collection. Uh, just a view of some of the other, for those of you who are familiar with this and to see our three artists in a movement, a generational shift from tradition to modernity is to see in these several images, these are from our, the walls of the family house at the time, when these artists would come, my father would give wine and set up the painting and get them to paint. And very often they would give my father the painting that they did. So this one is a mixed media piece that um, this is from the fifth moon movement for anybody who's heard of that, that um, from Malaysia. These uh, set of artists, uh, this is a relatively large piece that, that Moon uh, scape there is um, a lithograph on his, one of his um, exposition openings in Basel, Switzerland. Just a few others from, that are in addition to the artists we have here, um, that Jiang Hua, we've been talking about this by email that you hadn't seen his works before. It was on our family wall. He came to visit in 74. Um, uh, this is a very large four by five foot um, oil on canvas uh, with mixed media, so sand to make the earth of that mountain. Uh, some of you, uh, some of you possibly may know some of these artists. Uh, this is a lithograph. That's actually calligraphy that has been abstracted into geometric form. That was his uh, style. So this is just to contextualize our artists how important they were and how their importance also grows out of an entire two decades of Chinese painting painters coming to bring their works to 
finally, a couple of pieces from our collection. You may recognize we we have a version <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, that Professor Liu gave to my father uh, after he taught my father first. You must study the tradition. I remember my father practicing, practicing. So this is from the family collection, and then the student shows what he tried. <laughs> <laughs> you can see. So that the scholar, both in, from my father's point of view, perhaps because of his biographical background, both tries to understand and frame and explain, but also learn from his subject, from these great painters. And with that, I thank you. That's one of my father's abstracts. If you ever want to reach me, I'm at Stanford. Uh, and I use this as an opening to our next speakers who also have parts of the record of these three artists being exhibited in our community. Thank you so much. So next we'll have um, Donna Connell, who is the curator of the uh, Villa Montavo Art Center. And these three uh, masters across the Pacific Ocean had a joint exhibition at Villa Montavo in 1965. So Donna's going to share some of the wonderful, wonderful pictures and memories. And so they dig out of from the archives <laughs> from Villa Montavo. Oh, let me get a coil file out. Okay. Let's fix things. Not quite. So we have the uh, let me stop new shapes and screen. So this and ah, uh, where's our folder? Oh, it's gone. Oh, huh. let me let me. Where is the, huh? We have the, all the photos here. Yeah. Um, no, it's not here. And, well, it's weird. <laughs> it was here. <laughs> oh, so maybe, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, that would be wonderful. So the laptop is not quite cooperating today. Here we go. It is here. Okay, so we'll close this. And, oh, hmm? it's not quite. Strong. Yeah, we have a uh, book. You can say a lot. Sure. Uh, 
。哦，我停止 share 了，我停止 share 了。我哎，我停了呀，我这里停了。<笑>我 pause 了 ，pause share 呀。你要 resume 才他才会重新 share 啊。我看了见，外面看了见。Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you just press this button here to move along. So you can press this to go to next picture. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Janwa, for inviting us here today. And I want to also um, thank Roland Hu for the really wonderful talk. I mean, it was just so illuminating. Um, I'm here from the Montalvo Art Center, based down in Saratoga, California. My name is Donna Conwell. I work at the Artist Residency Program, and I'm here with my colleague uh, Catherine Nas Nasserman, yep. <laughs> um, who is a amazing researcher. Um, we have we came across these amazing artists um, while kind of digging about in our archives in Montalvo. We've been working for the past three years on a, um, a book project that was interrupted by the pandemic, but we're now in its sort of final stages. And the book project is really celebrating the residency program at Montalvo. Um, we had a residency program since 1939. We're the third oldest residency program in the country. Um, and in, uh, you know, we had continuous artists stay with us during that entire period. We closed the program in, 2000 um, and reopened in 2004 in a new facility on site with a separate dedicated campus that's now called the Lupus Artist Program. Prior to this, um, all artists had been staying in the historic villa and the adjacent cottages. Um, so 2024 will be the 20th anniversary of the Lupus Artist Program. So our publication is coming out to celebrate that uh, anniversary. Um, but as part of that, we thought it was really essential that we went back and we tried to sort of talk a little bit about this longer history of Montalvo as a residency program. So we are going to have a chronology in the beginning of the book. And our goal was to sort of identify who were some of these really special and important artists that were going through the program. And um, Catherine stumbled across this amazing story, which I know many of you know a lot about, but we uh, had a very little institutional memory of this, which was really kind of shocking. Um, so it's been a real um, joy to kind of uncover this, this story a little bit. And there's so many gaps in our understanding. So as um, Roman said, we are really here to learn from you and to ask questions. Um, we will hopefully be including some of this information in the book, along with, if I can get permission from the family, um, a photograph of the three artists um, with an installation view, which we'll, we'll show you in these pictures. But, you know, I feel like we've just kind of touched the, the top of the iceberg and it feels like there's a, a lot more uh, research and presentation that can happen around this, these artists being at Montalvo beyond the scope of this book. So I hope that this is like the beginning of a, com a conversation where we could explore how to raise up that history more in other kinds of ways, in addition to the book. Um, so I, I'm just gonna share with you some of the photographs that we found in the archives of Montalvo. Um, we know that um, the three artists came um, in 1965 um, in February, they spent a month in residence uh, and then they held an exhibition. Um, in Montalvo's art gallery. Uh, this, um, and I'm gonna ask Catherine just to step in whenever with additional information because she really is our lead researcher and has is much more knowledgeable more than I. <laughs> um, so this is an image of an artwork that, a photograph of an artwork that we found along with these other images uh, that seems to have been, um, Oh, the image, it's not advancing. Yeah, uh, it's from 1963. Oh, oh this well, is from 1963. By James Liu, the tree, the banana tree and the farm, and the Chen Yu Po painting the cat and the, the insect, this uh, insect. Oh, oh yeah, because it was, it looked like it was, um, oh, okay, uh, thank you. It was a collaborative, 
a piece of, of some sort. Yeah, Is that yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Can you fall? So that was exciting. And then here we have an image of the three artists in uh, one of the Lomontavo's galleries. Um, this is an example of a gap in our understanding. We, we, we don't know who the person um, in the middle is. So if anyone can help us with that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> um, but here they are standing in front of um, some of their work. And this is just some of the information on the back. We, we do have some of these other images of um, like a, a dinner that was held for the artists with some various uh, Montalvo affiliated participants that again, we're sort of trying to identify who these individuals were. Um, a lot of these photographs have, um, you know, the stamp from um, Professor Liao. So I'm wondering whether he actually took these photographs and then gave, gifted them to Montalvo. Um, I'm afraid they're a little bit out of order, but I'll, here's another gathering here, but I want to show you. Oh, okay, so here's another view in Montalvo. Um, I'm assuming this means that some of the works were acquired and maybe these were um, some of the, the lucky uh, folks who purchased, who purchased those works. And here they are all seated out this out on Montavo's grounds, I believe. Do we have any sense of who these are? Yeah, we're not quite sure. I can only make guesses. Yeah. I know, uh, again, Mildred Coucher, the gallery committee lead, and uh, Warren Faust is also very active. So could be. Mm -hmm. I have to find some pictures of them, do some comparison. Yeah, we're really interested in, um, you know, and Roland's talk was so incredibly illuminating in this regard. So try, well, we know that they came here as part of this Carnegie Corporation funded project, but how did this connection particularly to, why did, why was it Montalvo and who reached that, you know, why was that specifically the place that was reached out to? Mm -hmm. Who was the conduit and bridge for that that's right we don't have any information on about that and we really want to try and understand that more we, we you know we know that there was a kind of institutional interest around that time in um cultural exchange of some sort but what you know how this all fitted into that larger mission and idea and who was driving that it's it's very very murky and um so yeah we're really trying to kind of and cover, cover that a little bit more. Here they are out and about. And this is, yeah, this, and she was the, the sister of Mildred. And Mildred was the, ran the gallery, correct? Right, yeah, right. And, and Dorothy, I believe, was a professor at San Jose State, and they worked together, the two sisters. Oh, okay. Um, and she was at San Jose State. Yeah. Okay. We haven't been able to find an exhibition brochure, have, have we, so far? No. Oh, yeah, yes, this is a really yeah. lovely one. Uh, yeah. We use all the posts. Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> right. that's right. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So, so for those of you who are not haven't been to Montalvo, this is on the front veranda, um, which has is a has a very nice sort of view of the lawn and down down into the valley. So, oh, okay, so this is what the, the view oh, okay, the other yes. way, looking down. So Montalvo at this time um, had, had its galleries inside the historic villa. Um, now that doesn't happen anymore, but um, we have a kind of designate, designated gallery space, but there would be sort of temporary exhibits that would go up several times a year. Oh. 
I believe um, I shared these images with our book designer, and I believe this is the one that she was really gravitating towards including. So um, I would really love to get ask for kind permission to reproduce this and share this with um, our readers. Sorry, that's the, the, the way, wrong way up. <laughs> this is another view on the side of the villa. And I think we may have come to the end of um, our uh, group of uh, photographs here. Um, I'm wondering, do you have anything, Catherine, that you'd like to add at all? Um, you know, we are still going through um, the materials and happy to share anything that we else that we come across, but. Um, I, yeah, I guess I, if I have a, my question is, you know, would anyone hazard a guess as to why Montalvo? What what was it about that particular organization? I mean, it is right after, right, February. Mm -hmm. So the San Francisco State show closed January 1st, according to that press release. So this could have been the next formal show. Mm -hmm after interviews and um, he was organizing demonstrations, how they would paint. Mm. But this one is a real, another show. But I don't think it would have been, uh, my guess is it wasn't my father organized because he was much more connected with universities, mm. with students. Uh, what about in, the, in terms of the timing of uh, Paul Hall? Yeah, Paul Hall. Would, would he have been? At yeah, this time, Paul Hall introduced them uh, connecting the three artists with uh, Villa Montano in mm. 1965. So, in our archival, we have a photo is uh, Paul Hall's wife and we with three artists and one of artist agent in one photo. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so perhaps. That's interesting. I'm looking for that. Yeah, I can yeah, show you the photo. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and he had been a resident, is that right? No, he hadn't been a resident, but he was a local person who mm. took an active role. Yeah, he lived show. in Los Angeles. Right, right. so right. that were they've been on the same path. So yeah, the community. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we're really happy to have had this opportunity to share. Yes, yeah, thank you. These so photographs with you, and again, thank you very very much for having us. <laughs> Do you have a collection of other exhibit brochures? Yeah. Just missing this one? We, we have some, don't we? Yeah, okay. Huh. You know, um, I, okay. I spent a lot of time in the archives. So, Thank you, Donna, for sharing with yeah, us so the wonderful, wonderful so pictures and the stories behind yeah. the photos. Yeah. Uh, we'll go, we are going to end the Zoom meeting today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We'll see you next time. But um, okay, I will end the Zoom meeting now. If you have any questions, please um, uh, put it in the chat or email us or, or, or go, in, go on to our website. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll post this uh, video on YouTube later next week. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we'll end, leave, and end.